Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to our Boreal Toad and Aquatic Habitat Assessments training. We are so excited to have you here. Um, we know that it's a difficult time with COVID-19 and everything happening around that. So we are really, really grateful for you being here despite all of that. Um, this is an, such an important project and we're just grateful to get to work on it with you. Um, you really are the reason that this is possible. Um, and these critical data gaps could not be filled without you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't say that enough. Um, I'm going to go over just a few housekeeping things, some Zoom things, and then I will pass the mic over to our wonderful scientists who will be talking to you today. So first off, please just note that each of you is muted and you cannot share your screen or camera so nobody can see you. <laughs> um, only hosts and panelists can share our video or screens. So as you think of questions, rather than asking them live, you can type them into the Q&A box. So to see that, just navigate to the bottom of your screen and click on Q&A and it will pull up a box and you can see uh, which questions have been answered already and ask your questions there. Um, and so we'll be answering those during the, the presentation or during one of our Q&A breaks live. And then also, if you have any comments or resources or thoughts that you'd like to share during the presentation, you can use the chat box, which is down at the bottom of your screen as well. Um, so if you just type those in there, you can either send them to everyone or you can just send them to the panelists, which is myself, Kaylee and Mary. Um, and then we'll also have links we'll be sharing in the chat box that we'll refer to during the training, like the sign up sheet and form. So just keep your eye on that. Um, and then also when this is finished, uh, just know that we will be sending you a follow up email with this training recorded so you can refer to anything um, on here and also with materials that will be helpful for you as you continue. Um, so if captions would be helpful for your experience, please just let us know and we will be happy to send you a recording of this webinar with a transcript following the training. And then we also, uh, with COVID-19 going on, we just wanna make sure that you all know that we, really, we totally support uh, everyone following state guidelines and orders around COVID-19. Um, we usually recommend that folks go out with another person to do this volunteer work. And so we just ask that it's some, someone from your household if you can, and if not, that you let someone know where you're going and when you plan to return and check in with them. Your safety is our priority, so we just wanted to make sure that that is known. And along the same vein, um, for the field trip component where folks will join Kaylee to go out to different sites, uh, we're also keeping COVID in mind as we plan that. And that will not be starting until later in the season and we'll be keeping up with COVID recommendations. So just know that. Um, yeah, that wraps up the housekeeping that we need to go over. Um, but thanks again for joining us. This is just a wonderful reason to get outside during this time and to be a part of an important conservation work. So we're just happy to have you here. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic to our wonderful scientists. Uh, Mary, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then Kaylee will get started with the presentation. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the 2020 Boreal Toad Survey and Aquatic Habitat Assessment Training. Um, I am an ecologist. I work for Wild Utah Project. Um, we are based out of Salt Lake City. And we are a nonprofit whose mission is to bring forth science in service of wildlife and conservation. Um, we work to gather field data and provide mapping and scientific literature, conservation planning support to our partners. And our partners include academicians, nonprofits, state and federal agencies, and municipalities. Um, and you know, many of our projects have a citizen science component to them, where we partner with local managers and other nonprofits to fill crucial data gaps on the landscape regarding the distribution of species and habitats and the condition of those habitats. So oftentimes the state or federal wildlife agency, um, those habitat managers uh, are tasked with making conservation and restoration planning decisions in the absence of some 
data, right? Either a data gap on the landscape or having the most up-to-date data sets uh, pertaining to a species location or maybe habitat condition. So were it not for the support of community scientists like you all on this project, um, uh, we wouldn't necessarily be able to gather that sort of robust information. So thank you for attending tonight. And for all of you who keep coming back to the Boreal Toad training assessments year after year. Uh, and with that, I will turn the mic over to Kaylee Mullen. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mary and Sarah, for putting this together. Um, my name is Kaylee. I work with Utah's Hegel Zoo. I will have been there three years next month, which has flown by. I'm in the conservation department. Uh, and if we could just click this slide to the next one, Mary. There we are. Uh, so hopefully some of you have been up to the zoo and seen what we're all about. We are a nonprofit and we really focus on four pillars. Uh, the first and foremost, obviously, animal welfare. And then we really pride ourselves in the education that we can give the public, both on grounds and through many classes and camps that we host throughout the year. Uh, conservation is a pivotal role of the zoo, both through our species survival programs. We have very detailed breeding programs for endangered animals on grounds. And we also do a lot of field work globally. We focus on six main species, one of which is the boreal toad, so that is our local conservation species. We have a boreal toad conservation center on grounds at the zoo, and that is off exhibit. And it is our assurance colony of boreal toads that were collected as eggs from the Ponsagant Plateau, which we'll talk about later on. And then the other section to this boreal toad work that we do is our community science program. And just to kind of repeat what has been said already, it, it could not be done without you guys. Utah is big, these toads are very small. We need all the manpower we can get to help keep collecting data on these guys. So again, thank you. Uh, and I think we're actually rolling into our ninth, maybe even 10th season working with these toads. So it's uh, super exciting. I love this time of year when we're about to like, kick off the field season. Uh, and of course, we couldn't, we couldn't do this to the extent that we do without the help of the Department of Natural Resources. Um, and that is an umbrella organization. And I want to talk about two particular divisions within there. Uh, the Division of Wildlife Resources, they have been monitoring boreal toad for over 20 years throughout the state, all the way from the Grouse Creek mountain range up on the border of Idaho down through that central spine of Utah to the Ponsagant Plateau, which is our southernmost population. And the DWR have been monitoring everything from different breeding sites, population estimates, growth rates, they have tracked toads, they have movement data. And what they have seen throughout most of these populations is this dramatic decline in numbers, um, which we'll get into again later on as well. And then secondly, I just want to talk a little about uh, Utah Geological Society. Diane with the UGS has been actually keeping tabs on the boreal toad database. She collects all of the data from every biologist involved every single year. And that is not only data on the toads, but all of the aquatic habitat data. And she is busy right now preparing maps and graphs and all of these really nice visual outputs that we will be able to use to help see what is happening out in the field and future directions for what we are doing. So a quick overview of the training. Uh, this first chapter will be just all about the boreal toad, its background, its life histories, and then we're going to flip to our community science project. What is community science? What is this project all about? Then we're going to break for five to 10 minutes and have an open question and answer session before diving into field survey protocols. And in that section, we'll be going over some of the field gear that you'll be using and the data sheet that everyone uses, including the DWR and the Forest Service. And then we'll wrap up with a final Q&A. And that'll be the night.
So to begin, we'll talk about the boreal toad and its background. And we're gonna to touch on the amphibian crisis, why you should care about amphibians, North American diversity, the star of the show, the boreal toads, what is currently being done and what you guys can do to help. So to dive right in, what is an amphibian? I'm sure you've all seen amphibians before. I'm sure you know much of this, but there's some really interesting things such as Amphibian actually means dual life. And this is due to the fact that amphibians spend the beginning part of their lives in water, and then they kind of go through this miraculous transformation onto land. Um, so to define an amphibian, they do spend part of their lives in water. They have gills during at least one stage of their life cycle. And what is fascinating about them is they evolved 350 million years ago. That's an unfathomable amount of time. And it actually makes them the oldest vertebrate class alive today, which is pretty amazing when you think they got it right so long ago. There are three orders of amphibians. We have um, newts and salamanders. We have Sicilians, which are these kind of limbless looking amphibians. They kind of look a little like worms. And then anurans, which we are focusing on today, and that is frogs and toads. So what do I mean when I talk about the amphibian crisis? Well, they are actually among the most threatened lineages today. There was a paper published last year that suggested 50% of amphibians are threatened with extinction today, which is crazy to think about. Um, that is 3,000 species of the 6,000 that we know about. And they're actually the most data deficient group of animals throughout the animal kingdom. So not only are they declining rapidly, there is still so much we don't know and we don't even know what we don't know, if that makes sense. And it kind of highlights why it's so important for programs like this to carry on, because we need to keep gathering that data so we can really get a grasp on what is happening and what we can do to help prevent these declines. And why is there an amphibian crisis? We have some preliminary drivers for their decline, um, mainly habitat destruction and fragmentation. And fragmentation is the splitting up of the habitats that they need. So for example, the boreal toad uses a certain type of habitat to breed, a certain type of habitat to forage in the summer, and then they find hibernation sites. And when those habitats get broken up by the drying of wetlands or by new roads being put in, it really affects their ability to thrive. Another reason is, is introduced species, such as the American bullfrog. They are in Utah, you may have seen one. And such species, they either directly predate on native amphibians or they completely outcompete them for food, the habitat. Overexploitation is actually another reason for their decline. Uh, and that can be both the pet trade for those beautiful colored dart frogs and even to supplement some human diet in some parts of the world. Climate change, um, well, it's, it's affecting most things, but very, very much the amphibian populations throughout the world, either through differences in UVB or differences in uh, especially snow-driven watersheds. It might be that um, the rain patterns and the snow patterns are shifting and so these wetlands that may have been there for many, many years are drying up earlier than amphibians are coming to breed and it kind of creates this disconnect and that can cause population declines also. Pollution is um, very deadly to amphibians. They have this semi-permeable skin. So they actually react to pollutants in the environment much more quickly than other animals. And this is why they're considered an environmental indicator. And lastly, but by no means least, the chytrid fungus. This is a fungus that is found on every single continent that amphibians are found on. And it attacks amphibian skin and it hardens it so they cannot osmoregulate in the same way. They end up um, almost stiffening up to the point that they can't move and it is fatal in most amphibian species. Uh, but why should you care about that? You know, you don't, you don't come across amphibians every day. They may not really play a big part in your life, but they are really important. And I think because they're so small and uncharismatic, 
people just don't often think about amphibians. Um, so I'm going to give you some reasons why they're important and why you should care. Firstly, they are cultural symbols. In today's day and age, they're actually like the most amazing symbol of growth and transformation. Like those morphological changes they go through. Uh, back in ancient Greece, Rome, and Egypt, they were considered considered symbols of fertility. And back in the Renaissance, it was believed that salamanders were kind of gods of fire, that they could tolerate any heat and even put out fires. Uh, secondly, tadpoles, they are brilliant at keeping water quality up. They are herbivores, so if you remove tadpoles from a system, it is easy that water bodies can become kind of choked with vegetation and they help prevent algal blooms. They are incredibly important in the food chain. Back to that dual life that they lead, they can carry nutrients from these aquatic systems to the terrestrial systems. And in many um, forests in South America, I think amphibians are actually the highest biomass of any vertebrates. So again, like a very key prey item for many predators. Uh, as I mentioned, they're environmental indicators this means that they can be considered a species that will be seen when the environment is good and those wetlands are nice and healthy. But when you start seeing them disappear, you may start to question the health of that water body and that environment because they are so sensitive to what's around them, the pollutants, the water quality, pH, temperature. If the amphibians start to disappear, it may be the beginning of something that is gonna affect other animals and even humans eventually. Human medicine and research, um, frogs especially have played a huge role in the development of different medicines. Um, many Nobel Prize winners have, their research has been based on work that they've done with frogs and toads and then implemented it into humans. Um, and my most fun fact of this slide is that before the modern day pregnancy test, women used to pour urine on the African cord frog to find out if they were pregnant. And if they were, that frog would produce eggs within a few hours. So that's um, a cool and gross fact you can share at your next dinner party. Uh, and finally, pest control. They are just ravenous and they eat pesky mosquitoes and flies and things that bother humans on, on a daily basis. And it's actually great for um, disease control to things like West Nile virus and things that are transmitted through human populations through mosquitoes. So let's bring it down to North America. We're actually a pretty diverse country for amphibians. Um, we don't hold a candle to Brazil who have the most species of amphibians, but we do pretty well. North America is actually, or the United States I should say, has the most salamander species of any country in the world. Um, it is a salamander biodiversity hotspot. And this has been recognized by um, the government and by organizations. So I, I spoke about chytrid being something that affects all amphibians. And there's a certain strain of chytrid fungus that affects only salamanders. And it is found in Europe and it's decimated populations. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service kind of jumped on that I think it was in 2016 now, and they listed 201 salamanders on the injurious wildlife list to try and prevent salamanders coming into North America and potentially bringing this strain of chytrid that attacks salamanders into the country. And I think so far we've been successful with that, so that's really cool. And it's nice to see actions like that have a big conservation impact. There are 36 species of amphibians on the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we have um, nonprofits and different organizations coming together, such as Amphibian Arc, that help um, coordinate and develop reading programs for different amphibians for reintroductions. Uh, also, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, they really do focus on breeding programs and reintroductions and help put a lot of money back into field work all over the world. So let's narrow it down to our superstar, the boreal toad. Um, the scientific name for boreal toad is Anaxorus boreus boreus. And if we break that down, Anaxorus is 
of all North American true toads, which suits it well because it's found in only North America, kind of along this west coast here from Alaska down to Baja California. Boreas is ancient Slavic for of the mountains, which is suiting as well because the boreal toad is a high elevation species. You will only find them at 5,000 foot and above. And they are a highly terrestrial toad. When you think of amphibians, you often think of these aquatic systems and kind of frogs hiding out in the pond, but they're actually very terrestrial. So boreal toads, we have some really nice photos here. Uh, they have some defining characteristics. They are considered a medium-sized toad. You can kind of see here, it's a nice, nice handful, a nice big female there probably. They have these green-brown color morphs, and they have these irregular, um, we'll call them warts, just spread across their backs. They're not warts and they cannot give you warts. Um, a very defining characteristic is this creamy dorsal stripe that you see running across the back here. There is one other toad in Utah that looks very similar to boreal toads. It's called the Woodhouses toad, but they will not be found at the same, um, same elevation as boreal toads. So if you're in boreal toad habitat and you see a toad that looks like this, chances are it's a boreal toad. Uh, on the underside, you have these beautiful, irregular, inky black spots across the belly. And hopefully we're going to hear what they sound like right now. I didn't hear that, but hopefully you guys did. And we will get another chance to hear that later on in the presentation. So boreal toads, we just saw some nice adults there, but again, um, as mentioned, they have these crazy transformations. So they begin, obviously, as amphibians, as eggs. And toad eggs are actually oftentimes in Utah, as opposed to frog eggs, laid in these like, strings, in these gelatinous strings, whereas frog eggs in Utah are usually laid in clumps. So that's like a very easy distinguishing feature right off the bat. Tadpoles are pitch black and they kind of have this teardrop shape for as many tadpoles are more oval. And their eyes are inset on top of their head. So the outline of the tadpole, you can see it's very, very smooth. And we'll, we'll get into this a little more later on when we're identifying uh, boreal toads from other amphibians that you might find at those high elevations. So they eat a delicious diet of insects and worms. They love to travel. As I mentioned, they have different habitat requirements at different times of the year. So it's very important for them to have this, what we call habitat connectivity between wetlands, meadows, and forests. They hibernate up to six months of the year. They're not a freeze tolerant species. So they will find mammal burrows and tunnels and under logs and kind of burrow down below that frost line. And they will stay there for up to six months and they kind of slow their whole body down and then they emerge for breeding season and the best thing about them is that they smell like peanut butter freshly ground peanut butter which i don't think is a very good defense mechanism myself but they do as they do so here in utah we have several isolated meta populations um you can see it really nicely follows that high elevation spine of Utah. And what a meta population is, is it's several populations that do connect with each other, but that larger portion is isolated from other populations. And we've kind of roughly started out where we find them. And the DWR have done just an astounding job at collecting data on these guys for two decades now. There are still some data gaps in our knowledge, and that is where we need you guys to come in and help us. We need to know where they continue to breed. The, um, the best thing in the world for me would be finding new breeding sites this summer. So we want to investigate habitat where we know looks really suitable for them to be, but maybe they haven't been seen for years. Maybe it's a new wetland that hasn't been surveyed. So we have some data gaps, like where are all the breeding populations? How far are they moving to hibernate? It's all things that we continue to study every year. And the more data that we can gather on these guys, the better we can kind of set these conservation priorities and prevent them from declining. Um, 
And that is what we do know is that the populations have been declining. We know most of the reasons why, and we are tackling that. Uh, chytrid fungus is positive here in Utah. Um, it is positive in many populations, so that is something to be mindful of. And we'll talk about how to inadvertently prevent um, preventing the spread of chytrid when we are out there on the sites. So um, we spoke a little how, how Hogel Zoo and Wild Utah and the DWR have been working in partnerships. And there are many partners working with the Boreal Toads right now. And they're working, we have Omaha Zoo, Denver Zoo, Hogel Zoo, Loveland Living Planet Aquarium, and Wild Wheat Fish Hatchery down in Southern Utah, working with an assurance colony. And that is toads that we have on site that were collected as eggs from the Pontagon Plateau and we raise them and we hope to breed them and reintroduce them. And last year, I must mention, they are very fickle lovers. You would think, um, for example, at Hogel Zoo, we have our assurance colony and our toad keeper, Josh, he plays them rain sounds, he plays them breeding calls, he plays them romantic music, he has little rain showers and he has just all these beautiful things and he pairs them up and they're just, not interested. So they're fickle and there's a lot that we're still learning about getting them to breed but last year Denver Zoo did breed a pair and I was lucky enough to go down to the Ponsco and, and we released 600 toadlets and it was just it was the best so we're going to keep keep at it with that program get those numbers back up out in the Utah wilderness. Uh, another pillar of what we're doing is education and outreach our team at Hogel Zoo, they visit every single second grade class in the state and they see, I think about 15,000 children every year. And they bring tiger salamander and boreal toads out to the schools and teach about wetland habitat and wetland conservation and about the boreal toad. And filling data gaps, uh, you'll hear this a lot throughout this presentation because it is so critically important to do. Where are the toads? Where are they breeding? Where are they moving? What habitat do they need? What is that home range? Like, what do we need to be protecting out in the landscape to make sure they can get everything they need to thrive? And part of that is habitat improvement, such as beaver dam analogs. Um, I know World Utah have been really present in creating BDAs throughout Utah. Cattle fencing, just, just fencing off tiny portions of wetlands where we've seen eggs year after year. And it kind of just protects them from the cattle until they can grow into toads. Willow planting, a lot of willow planting is being done in these wetlands. It really helps that bank stabilization. It helps keep the water cool, which is good for getting oxygen in there. So a lot of habitat improvements have been done. And especially on the Ponsagon, that's really important because you don't want one type of program, such as breeding, not to link up with habitat improvements because you kind of need all the pieces of the puzzle for these things to be successful. And that is why all of these partnerships are so important because everyone is bringing expertise to the table. So back to you guys, what can you do? So much, that's why we need you here. Um, it's really nice to learn more by attending webinars like this. You can kind of learn a little bit more about one of your local species. You can practice leave no trace when you go out into the Utah wilderness, out on the trails, out on the campsites. If you find a boreal toad or really any amphibian, you can appreciate it, look at it, you know, take some pretty photos. Um, try not to touch them. Uh, you are, you'll be completely safe, but it really can affect the amphibians if you have any like sun cream on your hands. Uh, be an eco-friendly consumer. Be mindful of your water usage, especially important in Utah. I think we're the second driest state in the USA, perhaps the driest. Um, and I just heard today that this April was the driest since the 1930s. So again, we, we kind of need that water out in the wetlands for, for amphibians. Um, preserve habitat, uh, even create habitat. If you're lucky to have land, then think about making a little amphibian sanctuary in your yard. Support local conservation groups, um, such as World Utah Project and other local groups around Salt Lake, and join our community science program. So 
So that was just a little introduction to the boreal toad. Um, so now I think we'll dive into community science and what that means and what this project is. So we're going to just briefly go over what is community science, examples of some well known programs, the aim of this program, the history and data collected so far, ways that you can participate, how to sign up, and then we'll briefly look over the 2020 field calendar. So what is community science? Um, a really nice bite-sized definition that I have found is a research collaboration between scientists and volunteers. And there's just some, some wording here that I'll read out loud. Community science expands opportunities for scientific data collection or providing access to scientific information to community members. A great way to collect large-scale, long-term data, which is exactly what we're doing. So some other cities, um, so we have recently made the switch from citizen science to community science. So excuse me if I use both, it is the same thing, just different wording. So community science programs, uh, some big ones that you may have already heard of, the Audubon Christmas Bird Count, that has been running for many years. It's one of the oldest community science programs to date. Um, maybe you have heard of Zooniverse. This is a really fantastic platform and it's a perfect quarantine activity if you're looking to stay in and help scientific data collection. Um, USGS, this is timely with the earthquake activity that we've been having recently. If you're anything like me, every time you feel a tremor or if you're really like me, your dog runs by you and you think you feel a tremor, you will look at the USGS website, you'll look at the latest earthquakes and see what, what number we're hitting. But they also have this really, really cool feature called Did You Feel It? And you can just sign this community science app on your phone and it helps USGS kind of track where those tremors were felt. Um, so yeah, it's just a really cool way for large scale data collection on earthquakes throughout North America. So the aim of this program, the Broil Toad community science work here has several main goals. Um, collect data where toads are, keep record of where they are breeding, monitor water quality in their habitats, keep track of population numbers, help with habitat restoration, and keep toads off of the endangered species list. So, the history and data collected so far. So how did we think about the times that we're going to go out? This is a graph from iNaturalist, which is also a really, really fantastic community science driven data collection website. Um, you can use iNaturalist today, tomorrow, any day. You just take photos of species, live species that you're seeing and upload it. And then other volunteers using the website will identify that species. And it's a really fun way to explore what is being seen in your area. There's all these filters. If you're interested in the birds that are seen in your area, if you're interested in seeing where rattlesnakes are being found, iNaturalist is a really great source for you. And this graph came from there. It's observations that were submitted over the year. So you can kind of see the peak there. And this is kind of where we've based our survey season on, you know, when we're seeing toads. And again, we're seeing them because they're coming out of that hibernation and to the breeding ponds. The breeding ponds are particularly important because this is such a terrestrial species. And once they congregate in the breeding ponds, we kind of see those higher numbers are easier to find. And after breeding season, they do move away again and they become harder to find kind of individuals in meadows and mountains and forests. So we use a naturalist. And then we use historical records from the DWR. Uh, where have we seen toads? We use the aquatic data collected and kept by UGS because that will lead us to sites that look very suitable for broil toads, even if they haven't been seen there. And then we have the logistics of kind of being near Salt Lake City as well for the day trips. So just briefly, over the last five years alone, we've had uh, well over 100 community scientists join us in our surveys. We have put in around 5,000 field hours 
across 130 sites throughout the state of Utah. And we have helped take biometrics and collect data on hundreds of toads. And, and all of this data is going back to the Forest Service and the DNR and even the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And it's really helping guide these conservation actions. There are several ways that you can participate with us. Uh, as mentioned, keep on supporting those local conservation groups. Uh, you can join Mary and I on a survey. We'd love to have you. And we are also having independent surveys this year where you can collect what we call a toad bucket that we'll get into. And it has all the field gear that you will need to conduct independent surveys. Um, so please drop by and pick one up if you're just going on a hike in the Cottonwoods. And Mary has created a list of sites where we really need some surveys completed. So if you're interested in any of those, please take ownership of one of those sites too. So we'll dive into that a little bit more. So um, Fogel Zoo has created a calendar for the summer and it highlights all of the camping trips that we have. We have a camping trip every week from June through to the middle of August. Um, we're doing things a little differently this year with COVID in mind. Everything is tentative. Um, we are asking people to drive their own vehicles down to the sites just to kind of prevent everyone being, you know, in those tight quarters of the truck. Um, so we will, I think the the link has gone into the chat box to have a look at that spreadsheet with all the different camping sites on. And if you want to look at it right now or right after this presentation is finished and start signing up, there are columns and it will ask you for your name and your email address. And that's all you need to do for now. And then I can get in touch and give you more information on those field trips. Um, I understand the field trip can be quite the commitment. They are two to four days long. So maybe you have a wetland that you hike past all the time and you have wondered what amphibians are living there. Maybe you want to, you know, really take ownership of a certain site and really connect with some public lands that you've enjoyed in the past. And for then you can sign up to independent surveys. Um, we have a list of sites and we are asking that people visit them one to three times from May to September. And again, this is a link that you can follow and see which sites they are. And you can sign up to go one to three times and like an anticipated time that you will be able to go. And most of these are in the Cottonwoods and the Central Wasatch Mountains. So it's a really, really great reason to get out for the day and take. So how to sign up. The links are available in the chat box and we can go into this more in the question and answer session. We do have a community science resource website and it has all of this information on. It has information on the data sheet, has information on how to sign up, information on how to use different um, field equipment that will be in that toad bucket. And it has each calendar, both independent survey days and the camping trips. So we'll let you explore that after this presentation. Here is an example of the field trips with the group. So you can see here we have uh, the different sites, uh, the dates we are going, and then you can hover over just this cell here that says more information and it will, um, on the actual website, it'll come up with information about that site, history of it, boreal toads, how long we'll be going for, and just more things I could fit in that cell and make it look pretty still. So with COVID in mind, these are all tentative. Uh, people will be driving their own vehicle to these sites. Um, and it's just a new way that we'll be doing it this year. So I'm still super excited to get everyone out there. But we will, if you have come with us in previous years, things will look a little differently just to keep in those kind of guidelines set out by the CDC. And the independent site visits. Again, we have a list of dates and sites, um, GPS coordinates to help you find these different sites. And 
with these independent site visits, please do not hesitate to ask Mary and I any questions we can provide you with kind of aerial maps, we can provide you with information on trail systems and how to get there. Um, and you can see here, people have already started signing up and they have anticipated dates that they will be getting here. And we ask for these three separate visits over this time because we do have these like different life stages and when toes are breeding is so dependent on the snowpack and when the um, water bodies are there, when the snow melts. Um, again, it just adds to the elusiveness of this species and why it's so difficult to monitor them because they are just fickle, fickle species. So please do sign up for independent site surveys and again, ask Mary and I any questions throughout this presentation and after too. Well, perfect timing. Um, we're going to open the session up to questions and hopefully we can answer them live right now. So let's welcome back Mary and maybe Sarah. Well, thank you so much, Kaylee. That was a great intro to the project and the community science component. That was awesome. Um, we don't have loads of questions. I suspect some of that might be because we have a lot of return participants and we really mm -hmm. thank you all. Um, we do have a question. Are there opportunities to choose independent sites further south in Utah like Boulder Mountain? And I didn't type in the answer because I think it's worth um, talking to the whole group live about this. Um, you are absolutely welcome to uh, print off a copy or multiple copies of the field form, stick them in your pack, and wherever you think you might be seeing uh, potentially suitable habitat, and we'll tell you a little bit more about what that means so you can be informed about um, noticing those things yourself. Uh, you, can, you can absolutely do a survey and we will take that information and it, it will be valuable even if you don't mm -hmm. see codes. So if you see something that looks like suitable aquatic habitat, typically above 6,000 feet elevation, um, for boreal toad, that would be uh, phenomenal. And we can talk more about, you know, potentially adding your site or your location to the list of places that we wanna visit every year. So more than welcome to do that. And again, a little more info on that in the protocol section. Did you have something you wanted to add, Kaylee? No, no, only that um, we kind of mentioned these toad buckets, linking them to these Kind of day surveys around Salt Lake City but if you are going out camping for three or four days to Boulder Mountain to Thousand Lake Mountain you are so welcome to take a toad bucket with you and just kind of meld that into your trip as well so don't think that the toad buckets are limited to the Columbia Canyons because if you want to check one out for a week and you are traveling through southern Utah with it absolutely encouraged yep yeah, and we'll talk more about this, but um, you also, we're, we're still working on how we're going to coordinate picking up and dropping off equipment. If um, you're ready to head out somewhere already and we don't have that available, and we've done this in the past, where um, you can certainly do surveys without the equipment. You just won't be handling um, toads and you won't be taking water quality measures um, with the water meter, but the majority of the survey you can do with just the field form itself, as long as you can find your location and complete the form. So don't let the uh, field equipment uh, stop you from gathering habitat data for sure and observing amphibians. So I wonder, I'm not seeing any more, oh, looks like we've got Maybe one more question. Okay, do you have survey records for boreal toad sightings over Utah's history? Um, we are not the stewards of the all the historic data. That would be the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, and they do have that information. I'm going to talk about this a little bit about it when I talk about our site selection process. But those data for the historic records that the state has. Um, were used to inform the independent site list. And um, many of the breeding sites throughout the state, particularly in the drier central southern portions of the state, are very well known. They're visited every year, multiple times a year um, by the uh, state biologists. 
that uh, monitor boreal toad populations. And so those are very known, discrete, you know, wet aquatic habitats in the midst of much more arid and um, dry areas. But the uh, Uinta and the Wasatch that are more wet um, portions of the state, that is where we're doing more exploratory um, surveys for potentially suitable habitat because it's a little more needle in a haystack because you have so much potential habitat in those wet portions, um, particularly in the Wasatch and the Uintas. Anything to add to that, Keely? Okay. Okay. Um, there is another question in here. There is a sign about boreal toads at Twin Lakes in the Manti LaSalle forest in central Utah. Is that still an active location? Hmm. Let's see. Yeah, um, so I think the Forest Service um, and Division of Wildlife were working together to put those signs up um, a while back. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're working on updating the contact email or phone number for that. Um, I do not know, like within the last you know couple years, whether those are active places, but they're certainly potentially suitable um, and historic habitats. So that is something we could um, check in about and get back to you. Let's see, any other questions? Oh, I was just replying to Jean in the chat box, but she's come here to the Q&A, so thank you. Have they ever been found in Park City around Swanners? Every spring we hear either toad or frogs in the area. So if you are hearing um, calls, and particularly about around Swanner, you know, I'm not exactly sure what you heard at a given time, but my suspicions are if you're hearing calls in the spring, what you're hearing are probably chorus frogs. Um, the boreal toad isn't particularly um, known in this area for having a lot of loud, noticeable call. Um, they, they do make a sound that hopefully you heard in the previous slide and you'll have the opportunity to hear again when we demonstrate um, someone holding a, a boreal toad and doing a kidred swab. Um, so they have a little bit of a distress call and a copulating call during mating, but they they don't project like you normally think of frogs calling during the mating season. So if you heard a lot of um, calling activity around Swanner, my guess is that you're hearing chorus frogs. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Um, I do want to give a shout out. I'm really happy to see uh, we have some phenomenal partners who normally get an opportunity to talk and introduce themselves at this training, but to kind of keep the web training simple this year, um, we don't have the myriad of partners in front of you, but uh, we just have some amazing uh, folks working for Division of Wildlife Resources who are just so dedicated to boreal toads. And um, we've got a reminder to talk about habitat restoration and how beaver dam analogs and beaver introductions are connected to um, quality habitat. And we will touch on that later. Um, and you know, maybe we'll even figure out a way with extra time if people stay on to give some audio to some of our state partners if they're on at the end so they can speak. Kevin Wheeler, I'm thinking of you. So <laughs> if you want to, uh, we'd just love to give you an opportunity to be on this as well. Yeah, and Kevin, if you want to use the chat box to talk about the beaver reintroductions down the Ponsagon, I think people might like that. Yeah. <laughs> if not, I can go over it at the end too. <laughs> so I don't see, I don't see a bunch of other questions coming in. So I wonder if we might just mm -hmm. keep going with the presentation and then um, keep your questions coming at the end of the field protocol section. We will have all that remaining time for questions and discussions. And um, if folks want to share some of their conservation outcomes from the state, we've got one lovely uh, little video at the end, but uh, we're happy to 
share more of those if people make them available. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just before we go again, Heidi has said, we have seen toads in West Farmington. Is, we have seen toads in West Farmington and in Farmington. Is this a place that could be added? Um, I, I'm not sure boreal toads are there, but you know, who knows if, if you, are easily able to access those wetlands and they're not on private land and you want to do a survey there. Mm -hmm. I mean, collect data yeah. all over with those data sheets and I can, they may be wood houses, definitely. We, we can see how similar those toes are with that creamy dorsal stripe. Um, I will plug in another community science project right now and that is Frog Watch USA. That is a national program where people can conduct auditory surveys around where they live and add what they're hearing to a national database. And the trainings have been completed this year, but I do have a sound cloud of all of the vocalizations of frogs and toads in Utah. And I can share that link on the community science page too. And you can kind of pick up the different sounds and it will help you ID the frogs and toads that you're hearing in your area. So hopefully that will help ID some things. Great idea. Well, that was, that was great. Thank you for your questions. Please keep them coming and we will again answer those at the next uh, break. So if you look up at our overview here, we are well through um, some of the content and again, opportunity for Q&A after we go over the field protocols. Let's see here. So on to the field survey portion. Um, so during this portion of the presentation, we'll be discussing what data you all are interested in helping gather will do um, for conservation and what it will be used for. And also what's involved in conducting a survey itself, the field gear you'll be needing, um, we'll revisit a little bit of the natural history on boreal toads, specifically how to look for them during a survey. And then we'll go through the field form and the data sheet step by step. And finally, we have an exciting uh, conservation outcome to share that's related to uh, the boreal toad survey and habitat assessment work that has been done so far. So really excited to talk about some conservation outcomes at the end of all of this. Uh, but before we get into the details of the protocol, I just wanted to give you a, additional context for how data you all are going to be helping us gather can be used or will be used. Uh, firstly, we'll be filling data gaps on the landscape. And by that, I mean we will be visiting both known and potentially suitable aquatic habitats for amphibian breeding and assessing their current condition. Uh, this allows us and with the Division of Wildlife Resources, of course, and the Forest Service to gather much more information about habitat condition across the state. And this, of course, helps managers make more informed decisions regarding where to repatriate or reintroduce toads, as well as informing where habitat restoration um, efforts should be prioritized, where it's most likely to be successful. And this isn't just for boreal toad conservation, but for other amphibians, for fish, native plants, and other wildlife populations as well. Um, and then it also helps us get at things like water quality and quantity in general. So some of these habitat restoration efforts have already been alluded to, things like beaver dam analog. So um, shifting the landscape in a way that kind of mimics what beavers already do by increasing the water table, the water quality or quantity available, it also increases the footprint of the water uh, body and often means that you have a longer duration of water available. So um, making that water available so that uh, uh, tadpole eggs, tadpoles, metamorphs have a chance to develop before that water dries up. So all of those things um, to, to be able to prioritize all of that good work really need to have that baseline information about where habitats are, what their current condition is, and where the toads are using habitat. 
And then the other big um, uh, purpose or intention of this study is to engage community scientists. And by engaging, training, and empowering community scientists to participate in gathering data, we are not just working together and enjoying ourselves by working with the community and scientists and nonprofits and um, state and federal agencies, but we're really building capacity. We have so much more power um, by collecting data on a larger landscape scale and a bigger scope that we couldn't do without having trained a community scientist team uh, like you all. And that what that results in is more data, more robust data sets, more informed conservation planning and positive outcomes for wildlife ultimately. So we couldn't do that without you all. Um, just to give you an example here of the type of conservation planning and mapping products that can result from data you all are helping us gather. We have a map here uh, produced by Diane Manuz at Utah Geologic Survey. So uh, Kaylee has mentioned her before. Um, she has placed some different color coded survey points that represent whether toads were observed um, for this particular season and whether the site has active breeding or not. And here we have a landscape level comparison of aquatic habitat suitability for boreal toads based on the habitat variables that are very similar to what you all will be observing and recording in the habitat assessment field forms, which we're about to go over. So as you can see from the legend and the gradient of colors representing um, the habitat suitability which can help inform those conservation planning efforts. Um, you can see that on the left-hand side. So that gradient from dark to light blue. Um, so if you're able to make that landscape comparison of potent more potentially suitable habitats, you know, that can inform decisions, really hard decisions that our managers have to make. You know, they only have so many resources, time and people. You know, where should they prioritize restoration efforts or reintroduction of boreal toads? Uh, without this baseline information you all are helping us gather, um, it's not, you know, it's tricky to make those really informed decisions. So remember for signing up, how you can participate. If you go to the Wild Detail Project website and see the Amphibian Project page, there is a link here to a community science resources page. And then when you select that, you get to the Boreal Toad Habitat Assessment page. And here are the two signups for the group visits. There's this link here. Um, and then for the independent site visits, you just click, click on this link here. And um, for the independent site visits, I just wanted to talk about these briefly. You've, you've already seen this, but um, again, this should be public and this link is available in the chat box if you don't wanna go back to your previous email. Um, it's in the chat box towards the beginning, both the independent and the group site visits. So you can join us for those, sign up for those tentatively. Um, and, you know, we're really grateful for whatever you all can do. But just as Kaylee pointed out earlier, each site has three potential date ranges. And that, the idea with that is to increase the likelihood of uh, coming across different life stages. So your chances early, if you go early, mid and late season, your chances increase of seeing, you know, mating adults, egg strands, tadpoles, metamorphs, and so on. Um, so just wanted to point that out. And it would, if you think of it as if you were to select a single site and take all three of these um, windows of time throughout the field season, generally starting May, going to August, maybe even late September. Um, you can think of yourself as stewarding that site, right? You're, you're um, kind of taking ownership of helping collect those data for that for this year. Um, that being said, if somebody has a site that you know you really want to go to, you are more than welcome to just copy and paste those rows at the bottom of the page and say that you're going to go on your own time too. So it'd be great to to get a lot of coverage here on the Wasatch. As I said, we're, we're still learning um, about where potential habitats are. In fact, last year, it, I think it'd been a couple decades since we saw, we have records of boreal toad at Silver Lake. And last year, Kaylee and I were lucky enough to be together 
um, with community scientists to, to see some toadlets. And so that meant we had active um, breeding and it was very, very exciting. So you just never know what you're gonna find. And again, if you don't see toads, just doing the assessment for the, su the potentially suitable habitat is super valuable. So with that, a little bit more about how the independent sites in the Wasatch in particular, how they were chosen. So this was on the basis of the historic toad locations um, and a potentially suitable habitat model, which took variables into account like uh, whether or not um, there were known populations historically, the presence of water throughout the year, uh, things like lakes surrounding wetlands, stream complexes and riparian corridors, and of course, uh, being above 6,000 feet in elevation. And then we've mentioned this before, but I'd just like to mention it again, the, you know, the Wasatch and the Uintas are very similar in this. There are narrow drainages. You might be hiking up a trail that in the spring, there's just loads of water coming down. And then later in the season, you can see where the seeps and springs are coming out of the ground, where there might be standing water throughout the season necessary for toads. But there's, we just don't have all of those things mapped. So um, for example, if you have chosen to sign up for a well-known site like Red Pine Lake, and as you're approaching, you're hiking up the lake, you notice a spring or a seep or water or a wet meadow, you know, go ahead and fill out a field form for that, you know, take a minute to stop and take some photos. Um, so you all are really helping us uh, in the discovery of potentially suitable habitat. So you don't have to just stick to that list. Like I said, just this summer while you're hiking around, you know, have some extra field forms in your pack um, and be ready to take photos and, and we will be interested in taking those data. Uh, we really appreciate your help. Uh, one thing I'd like to note also, you know, you, we typically think of breeding in ponds and lakes and these big standing water bodies, but we have stories from Division of Wildlife Biologists who have found tadpoles in little pools of water in the middle of two track dirt roads. So even just inches of standing water, especially different times of year, you know, it could have been much more water when they were breeding and when the egg, egg strands were laid, or maybe not. So you just never know where you're gonna find these guys and it'd be really nice to, um, to have your support in gathering more potentially suitable sites. Um, let's see, there's a nice picture of the Wasatch there. So just to go over briefly, we do have some expectations if you're going out independently on site surveys. And that, you know, firstly, is just that you're comfortable hiking fairly rugged terrain at times to uh, remote locations unguided. And that being said, if you go back to that independent site form, there is a column there that set, um, gives a, a categorical description of how difficult, the level of difficulty for the hike. So it can be easy, moderate, to strenuous. So you can select, you know, whatever is in your purview. So um, don't feel like you have to go to the uh, crazy, you know, rugged train if you don't want to. Um, and then the other expectation is that, you know, if you sign up for a site, hopefully you're visiting at least once, but it'd be wonderful if you made it out maybe three times between May and August, uh, like I said, kind of stewarding a, a site. And then um, if you sign up for a location, you can select a date that fits your personal schedule or dates. Um, and it can even be a range of dates, but just helps us get an idea of when people are out. Um, and we really, we always encourage people doing community science work in the field to take someone with you. Now in the time of COVID-19, we um, really encourage everybody to follow the best practices of the CDC and the um, social distancing that we've been asked to do in Utah and um, just do what is uh, safe and what you feel comfortable with even maybe beyond those regulations. Um, if you decide to go on your own because you maybe aren't uh, in a household with others, please at the very least check in with somebody, let them know you're going out, where you're going, and when you are going to check back in with them for your safety. 
Um, and then checking out field equipment, should you choose to take field equipment with you on these sites? Again, not, not totally necessary, particularly on the independent site visits. Um, we will be following up with you about where to go to check out equipment. So we'll follow up with an email um, with more information about that. And we'll make that as easy and safe for you as possible. It'll be akin to a curbside pickup from a restaurant or something like that. Um, packing lists, things you'll need. Firstly, you'll want to print off some extra field forms and you've hopefully you guys have already seen where those are available when you got this email, but we'll talk about that again. Um, there's a key or a cheat sheet that also goes along with the field form. Make sure you have a couple writing utensils, maybe extra piece of paper. The field buckets, the field kits that you'll be checking out will have a water quality meter or a multimeter, which is um, pictured here next to the cell phone. So you can always use a smartphone that you're familiar with or a GPS unit that you have. We will also provide one in the field kit. You can use whatever you want for um, your location services. Uh, you'll have a chytrid fungus kit and that just consists of an antifungal spray, a little scrubber brush for your footwear, whatever footwear you're using, um, as well as a chytrid swab to take a uh, sample from a toad to swab the toad, glorified Q-tip. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then any personal hiking equipment, all weather gear that you would normally take out hiking. And then please, please a field partner if possible. And then just reiterating, you can always carry extra field forms when you're out. Um, even if you don't have a field kit with you, you won't have the gloves for handling toads for their safety. So we would just ask that you, if you did come across toads, you're just taking photos. Okay, so before we get into the field form, a little bit about when you get to a site and finding boreal toads, we are looking for slow moving or, um, or still water. So low velocity streams, seeps, marshes, beaver ponds, reservoir margins, or just the perimeter of the water body, and even surrounding wooded areas could all be potentially suitable habitat. Um, boreal toads do use existing burrows made by small mammals and loose soil, particularly around the perimeter of water bodies. Um, so you're really going to focus on walking wetland, pond, lake, perimeters, stream. You're really looking for observing slow moving or standing shallow water or bank areas. And then you can always flip logs and woody debris. However, if you're doing that, um, just be mindful that you could end up with um, a venomous snake under there. So just uh, be really thoughtful. If, if you feel comfortable doing that, wonderful, but um, just be very cautious. And then just a reminder, the amphibians in the Wasatch, I have 7,000 feet, uh, above 7,000 feet, but I think um, we have seen at 6,500 and maybe a little below uh, boreal toads as well. But basically you're not gonna, at these elevations, you don't have a lot of things to confuse boreal toad with. And Kaylee mentioned this already, but just to go through in a little bit more detail um, for the field form, you know, the boreal toad looks very different than a frog, right? It has that rough, warty looking, but not true wart uh, skin and the mottled color. And then we have a tiger salamander that you could see at the same elevations and Western chorus frog, chorus frog you could also see. The chorus frog is much smaller as an adult, has smooth skin, does not have that creamy dorsal stripe. Um, and then the adult, Tiger salamander obviously will look very different. Um, we'll talk a little bit about larvae stages too. And then just know that there are a lot of different color morphs for boreal toads, even in Utah. So we have everything from this really dark gray green to kind of this beautiful, like rusty, almost red coloration um, and all sorts of things in between. And then you'll see very different size varietals. So Kaylee's already shown you some that are quite an actual handful all the way down to this little toadlet here that's you know akin to the size of a penny and you know putting that up against the chorus frog again smooth skin adults are much smaller um, but if you do 
you wouldn't confuse it still with a juvenile boreal, boreal toad because it's missing that creamy stripe. Um, and they are found in similar habitat, but again, very, very different looking. So at the juvenile stage or the larval stage, at first glance, you could potentially see a tiger salamander and think that you might be seeing a tadpole. But if on closer inspection, you will always see these external feathery gills. And so that is gonna be the dead giveaway that you're looking at a salamander larvae or tadpole, not a boreal toad. Probably the most challenging distinction that you would potentially have to make would be the distinction between a chorus frog tadpole and a boreal toad tadpole. So boreal toads are very solid black teardrop shape and their eyes are inset, which means the margins are smooth. Their eyeballs do not um, stick out. Whereas the chorus frog eyes really stick out from the margin here. Here's the actual chorus frog and boreal toad inset there. Um, and then again, just for reference, tiger salamander tadpole external gills here. The other um, distinction would be if you were to see eggs. So boreal toad egg strands look like this. At a distance, um, we're seeing egg strands here. Uh, I have seen these before and thought at first that they were debris or trash in the water. If any of you are old enough to um, have seen a cassette tape unraveled, it almost looks like that. <laughs> Um, so if you see something like that, that you think it might be wire or twine or just debris, take a closer look. It could be boreal toad egg strands. And those look very different from both the chorus frog and the tiger salamander have globular cl uh, clumped uh, eggs and often attached to vegetation. So the eggs will not be um, confused. Okay. So now that we kind of know what we're looking for, we are gonna go through the field form step-by-step step here. It is um, a single piece of paper if you print it front back, so you can print off a handful and fold them up in your pack. Um, and uh, we'll just go through page one here and then page two. Don't forget, along with printing off those field forms, you can print the supplemental um, form or cheat sheet, as we call it sometimes. It has some imagery and language here. So if you ever need a reference on that um, field form, you can take a look at that cheat sheet. So the first page of the field form goes over just the basics, the date and the time and the location, the weather you're experiencing, whether you noticed amphibians, uh, general description of the site, and if you observed any disturbance. So this first section, you can see here, um, you're gonna fill in the date that you're out, the beginning time. If you can fill out the end time, that's really helpful. It gives us an estimate of level of effort. Uh, I often, I'm notorious for getting, for forgetting to fill out the end time until I get back home or back to the office, but um, you can always fill that in after the fact. The site name, if you are visiting a site that you signed up for, please do try to use the name that's on the list. So that helps us identify um, really quickly if you're on one of the priority sites. And then if you can include your name and anybody that joined you on the trip, that'd be wonderful. The location, we have these listed as UTMs. That's kind of the default setting for most uh, GPS and the GPS that will be in your equipment um, kit. And that is, fairly easy to find. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the GPS, we're happy to talk you through this a little bit more. Um, for a lot of people, you just use your location services on your phone. Um, there are a number of free apps you can use on your smartphone listed here, um, but you can use whatever application you want. And for some folks, they just look at the location on their Compass app that comes standard with your phone. Often it shows latitude, longitude. If you're in the field and you wanna just write down lat long, that's fine. We can always convert it after the fact. So, um, and it's less of a concern if you're going to a known location, right? This is more if you come across something that's not already on the list and you wanna make sure you get that accurate location. So next on the field form, a multiple choice for weather. You can select mostly clear, zero to 10% cloudy, all the way to overcast 100% and experiencing rain and snow. 
wind, again, multiple choice, calm to strong. Um, rain estimate in the last 72 hours, multiple choice. Air temperature, I often fill that out after the fact, looking at like the nearest weather station or application on my phone. So this is what the completed, you know, first section of the field form looks like. Um, and then moving on to this middle portion of the field site or field form, hopefully people are able to follow along here. We have the amphibian section. Um, so first we're gonna ask you to indicate whether you, uh, whether you observed amphibians at all, just yes or no. And then this next column here indicates a water body number. And I'm actually, I think I'm gonna actually skip ahead to the next slide really quick and go back. Oh, maybe I can't. Um, let me just skip here. So when we're talking about water bodies, if you go to a site, let's say that it looks like this. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a person standing at the edge or the margin or perimeter of a wet meadow. So where this vegetation is um, kind of lighter in color and lower vegetation, this is all a big wet meadow here. And then the vegetation changes. And then let's say just for the sake of discussion or an example that you have a pond that's obscured by this tree. So maybe you have a wet meadow, you have a discrete pond, and maybe there's even a stream coming out of that pond. We would call those three different water bodies at the same site. Um, and so you are going to make that determination here in the amphibian detection site. So let's say we're calling the, um, the pond or lake water body number one, and perhaps wet meadow is number two, and then if there's a stream, that's number three. So specifically where you see an amphibian, you want to indicate which bot water body you saw that in. And you may have anywhere from one to three uh, water bodies on the same field form, and that is fine. And if you have more than three, you can just start a second field form, and that's okay too. If you see an amphibian, and you can ind indicate the species, you can always put unknown and take a photo if you don't know. Um, we also want you to check whether it was an adult, a juvenile, or a tadpole or metamorph, or maybe you see egg masses. We'd also like you to indicate whether it was calling or whether you made a visual or auditory um, survey. So here we have an example where I'm suspecting water body number two might be this wet meadow and they put chorus frog because they know the call and they heard it calling but didn't see it. And in the case of chorus frog, that's very likely because they're tiny, tiny, and when you get close, they stop calling and they freeze. So they're really tricky to observe unless you have experience with that. Whereas if you see an adult um, boreal toad, it's not likely you heard the call, but you made a visual observation. Okay. And so here we have that example, you know, we've got two adult toads and we've got an egg strand here. Um, so you'd want to indicate all those different life stages and which water body you saw those in. The other thing that we want to note is we'd love it if you could attach photos with the associated observation of the amphibian. Um, and if possible, uh, go ahead on your field form and give it an alphanumeric code. Maybe it's your initials or the initials that you make for the site and photo number one. So if this was me, maybe I'd put um, one MP, two MP for each photo. Um, and then when you go ahead and email this field form, either take a picture of it on your cell phone front and back and email it. Um, also email those photos. It'd be wonderful if you remembered to assign the same alphanumeric code or name with the photo file so that we can absolutely attach the photos to the form. It's never been a problem in the past because, you know, I get an, a, a field form from somebody and the photos attached, I can usually sort it out. Um, but that would make our lives easier if you did that. Um, the other thing I'd like to note is if you see egg strands, tadpoles, adults, get a nice up close image of that species so that we can um, help you identify it or just double check that we've got the same right species here. 
And then also please take a, a photo a little bit at a distance of the surrounding habitat so we can see where that species was observed. Is it in a puddle in a road <laughs> or is it in the shallow margins of the wetland or the pond here? Okay, the next section on your field form, you'll see um, to the far right here on the amphibian section indicated here is the chytrid fungus section. So we just wanna take a moment to really talk about this. We wanna be helping this species and not inadvertently doing any harm by spreading chytrid. And so the way we do this is we wear gloves anytime we handle an amphibian. So really any amphibian you come across, it'd be good to be wearing gloves. And it's not for your protection, it's for theirs. Kaylee mentioned even just simply having sunscreen or some kind of product on your hands. But um, there's also the issue of holding a toad that has chytrid, you know, setting it down and then picking up another amphibian that uh, does not have chytrid. So we don't want to, to be spreading it amongst individuals. So we're always wearing gloves. And then whatever footwear you wear, you want to keep it clean. So here we have somebody cleaning their waders, um, but you know sometimes I'm just out in chacos if I'm just in and out of a wet meadow or sandals or uh, muck boots or hiking boots. So it can whatever boots you're wearing or footwear you're wearing, we will be providing um, the antifungal spray in the field kit as well as brush, a brush here and gloves. And um, so we just want to make sure that we're cleaning our footwear between sites. So if you're in that situation where you've hiked up to the wet meadow in the pond and the stream, you don't have to clean between those water bodies. But every time you go back to the car, um, clean your boots. And every time you get back into a car to go to a new site, you want to clean your boots. Um, the other thing that comes in the Kittreds kit is what I call a glorified Q-tip inside of its container here with the label. So if you observe a toad and you have the kit with you, you have gloves, you can perform a Kittred swab on the amphibian, which is really um, great information for us to have for reasons Kaylee already explained. So once again, just like with the photos, if you could maybe put the site um, on here and the date, and maybe if you were taking multiple swabs on multiple individuals, put some sort of alphanumeric code here and make that code the same as what you include on that field form so we can tie it back, the sample back to the form. And here we have a video demonstrating how to do the Kittred swab on a toad. And you listen for the distress call. Oh, it says, I can't play the media. Sorry about that, guys. So if you were able to view this video, what would be happening is you'd, you'd see this large swab going under the armpits, um, under the chin, between the fingers and toes, um, in all the nooks and crannies where you might expect um, a fungus or debris to settle on the individual and just being very you know, gentle to not drop the toad, but also not squish it. Um, and let's see. So now we're on to the site description portion of the field form. The, some of the information we're interested in includes other species. So if you observe fish, let us know yes or no. Or if you don't know for sure, just because it's deep water, you can always put unknown. If you happen to know the fish species, you could add it. Um, let us know if you search the entire area. It's totally okay if you didn't. And if you didn't, we'd like to know that. And you could indicate maybe you only walked the perimeter, the northern half of a large water body or wet meadow, and that is okay. Um, let us know if it's a natural area man-made if you're uncertain that's okay too same with drainage whether it's permanent or intermittent or none you can include a site description here this is a nice example a small permanent lake surrounded by willow um, the next section here we're looking at any disturbance you might observe at the site and so we use a scale here zero to no disturbance present five to high disturbance and if you look at the bottom of the form, you can see what we mean by that gradient of zero, basically no disturbance present in that category, or all the way down to extreme disturbances widespread or of high intensity across the site. 
So here we have an example of zero for residential, um, zero for water management, but we've got some twos and ones with grazing and livestock and uh, recreation. And so in the notes, we see several cattle present near the water's edge, two ATV riders present on a track. So um, if you can uh, just do a relative numeric value for those different types of disturbance, that helps us understand what's going on at the site as well. So that brings us to the end of page one of the field form. Bear with me, the backside um, actually will go a little bit faster, I think, here. Um, and it's also multiple choice. So once you get to the back, it's um, fairly straightforward and it's also redundant. So here we see the section for water body one. You may only complete one water body. If you're just going to a discrete pond or lake, you could be done once you get here. If you've got that scenario where we showed the wet meadow and the pond hidden by the tree with a stream, then you might have water body one is that wet meadow, water body two being the pond, water body three is the wet stream. So you're looking at these different multiple choice options to describe the types of water body, the turbidity or the clear or cloudiness of the water, the different types of vegetation present, the depth of the water, how much um, relative shallow habitat is present, and the substrate. So if we wanna know that for any and all water bodies that you show. And then this last bit of the field form is water quality or water chemistry, excuse me. So if you do have a water multimeter um, available to you, you can um, take some measurements of pH, electroconductivity, and temperature. Um, and then you can also make an estimate of flow, uh, whether it's flowing or not, the depth and um, turbidity. So at the very top of page two, we just want to complete this first section. So general characteristics of water bodies. So that's the whole site in general. First, you're going to let us know how many water bodies you note. So in this example, we've got two. So let's just say, um, in general, the water we see, whether we're looking at a stream and a lake or pond, the water is mostly clear. Um, so you want to indicate the, all the different water bodies present on this general section here. So here, for this example, we've got a permanent pond and a stream. And so here's an example of some of the different uh, water bodies, what they look like in our state. I think some of these are in the Wasatch. Actually, they're all over the state. Um, so here we have a spring head. It looks like a pond, but on closer inspection, the water is actually coming from the ground. Here you just see inches of standing water in this wet meadow. Awesome habitat. A lot of people, again, would look past this, but this can be really great habitat um, to find toadlets and uh, tadpoles and egg strands. Here we've got an active beaver dam, increasing that um, the standing water there and slowing the flow, making it good habitat. And an inactive beaver pond that's still you know, behaving as um, suitable habitat as it slows the flow of that water. Here we've got an example of a permanent pond, or this could be a lake, and standing water in a wet meadow. So again, this could be a discrete water body one, but then this surrounding wet meadow with inches of water in it could be considered water body two. Here we've got an example of a temporary pond or pool. So this could be what it looks like in late August, early September, but then maybe earlier in the season it had plenty of water and there were tadpoles in it. So this sort of thing is super interesting to check out, especially if you can go multiple times a year. We want to know when that water recedes and dries up and is it too late for the tadpoles that may have been in there to develop before the water's gone. Um, and then here we have kind of a traditional moss, marsh or bog. Um, so the next bit, the next variable you're looking at here for the general characteristics is vegetation. And again, multiple choice, emergent vegetation in the water. So this is water standing, um, or sorry, vegetation breaking the surface of the water. Is it abundant, frequent, occasional, or absent? Same multiple choice for whether algae is present, 
um, same multiple choice for whether submergent vegetation is in the water below the surface. And then we also want to know about chara in particular. So this is a form of submergent vegetation. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And then an estimate of max depth. Again, multiple choice. Is it less than a meter between one and two meters or is it above two meters in depth? And again, estimate this. We're not looking for you to wade out into the middle of any of these deeper waters. Um, emergent vegetation along the shorelines, also important for us to note. And as we heard before, shallows along the shoreline, super important habitat. We wanna know how much of that is present relatively and whether or not you have a silt or muddy bottom to your uh, water bodies. Is it abundant or frequent, absent, or occasional. So again, our cheat sheet here for algae, some images. So if you're looking at your water body and you see some green stuff floating in, around, above the water, what are we looking at here? Um, so you can always refer to your cheat sheet. Some images of surface algae. Um, this is some floating aquatic plant, emergent uh, vegetation types, uh, and sorry, emergent vegetation types over here breaking the surface of the water and then submerged vegetation here and then we have a particular section for um, chara or muskgrass. This really um, outcompetes some of the native submerged vegetation and so it's it's a variable that we're interested in because it kind of creates a different type of habitat for um, tadpoles in particular. So if you notice this it has kind of a radial structure to it relative to these other um, uh, native submerged vegetation. So if you notice that, we want to indicate it. All right, so again, we're in these individual water bodies portion of the second page here. Um, if we called that permanent pond or lake a water body one, we're just going to do those same multiple choice um, options here. Max depth just for that pond. What is the substrate? Is it silty or muddy or is it cobble? Um, and then the relative percent estimate for um, emergent vegetation. And we have a, a figure for you to estimate that based off um, uh, some polygons in the cheat sheet as well that can help with that. Same kind of multiple choice things here, but specific to just that one water body. And then you can do the same for the second water body. So if you have a stream, you know, here we had a silty muddy bottom for the permanent lake or pond, but here we see a sandy gravelly bottom for the adjacent stream. And then just a reminder, we may not have a third water body. So anywhere between one and three on a given field form, if you need more than three, you can fill out another form. Okay, I think we have already hit those. So now we're to the end of page two, the water quality section, almost done here. If you um, see any amphibians, egg masses, tadpoles in particular, floating in one of your water bodies, we want you to indicate which water body you're talking about. If there's an egg mass or tadpoles, if the water is standing or flowing, an estimate of depth, and then you can use your water quality meter to um, collect data on the pH, electroconductivity and temperature. And the way you do that is you'll have this uh, multimeter in your field kit. This image shows one without the cap on it, so you can see the little sensors. These sensors need to be submerged in the water for you to take those measurements. And at times you'll have to hold it in the water for an extended period of time until the numbers stop jumping around. Um, you're gonna turn it on with the power button and then you can toggle between these three metrics, pH, connectivity, and temperature, just by hitting this other button, the not power button, the set hold button. And if you press that, it will just switch between those three metrics. So again, um, sometimes you have to leave it sitting in the water, or not sitting, but you have to hold it in the water for a while, making sure those senses, sensors are submerged before the numbers kind of settle. And then the other thing you can observe is whether the water is clear or stained. And if you have a turbidity tube, which we do not send people out with, um, oh, excuse me. 
here. Um, but you could you could make a measurement of how the depth that you could see the water at, and you could kind of use anything if you had a Tupperware with you. But these turbidity tubes are huge, so we don't send people out with those kits. Um, some people go out with them, so we leave that option on the field form. And just a note for you all why we might want to know these water quality um, metrics for different sites. Um, there are literature out there that say that relatively high connectivity could be, could increase the habitat suitability for boreal toad, as well as a relatively high pH of eight or higher. Um, so having these measurements from year to year, if things change with boreal toad presence that also um, line up with changes in water quality, that's something that we want to know. So here's a completed field form. In this example, we just have the general characteristics filled out and water body one and two, nothing for water body three because we just had a pond and a stream. And then in this case, it looks like they had the water quality meter with them. So they were able to um, also get pH connectivity and temperature. And that is it for the field forms themselves. For data submission, this is, it's worked well for us in the past just to have people email their field forms. So if you have the capacity to scan, go for it. You can scan it and email it to me. My email is really easy to remember, just there, mary at wildutahproject.org. And you can also just take a photo with your phone, front and back field form, and then email those photos that you've taken as well. Um, if you're out in the field with Kaylee and I, it's likely that um, um, Kaylee will have those forms or I will have those forms anyway. If you're really interested in being a scribe or being part of the data management, you're welcome to participate in that even on the group visits and we'll just figure out how to do that with safe social distancing. And as promised, we're going to wrap up with a um, example conservation outcome. I hope this video works. It worked earlier. Oh. Let's try this. Bear with me. Earlier this year, Denver Zoo hatched, raised, and released more than 600 boreal toads into their natural habitat of Utah. It was one of the biggest conservation success stories of the year. Oops. Sorry about that. Here at Denver Zoo and a huge breakthrough for this at-risk species and we're getting ready to try it all over again in 2020. So what is a boreal toad? Why do they matter? And how did Denver Zoo become the first institution to successfully breed this population? Let's find out. Did we lose audio for a second? We did. Okay, let me go back. My apologies. Mm -hmm. We missed some crucial. And uh, we could follow the link maybe to the uh, internet as well. It might be a bit smoother. Uh, and they're in decline because they're getting infected with a fungus called chytrid that is spreading throughout their okay. habitat. And we've seen declines over the last couple of decades to the species and they're becoming isolated populations. And that's a, a big deal. And Denver Zoo is one of several AZA institutions 
trying to help breed this specific population found in Utah. Utah Division of Wildlife and Resources contacted us and were asking help get involved with a assurance population to basically bring in toads to the Denver Zoo to eventually reproduce them um, to be put back into the wild. Well, when they came to us, they were metamorphs, very young frogs, and we brought them in in 2010. So we needed to wait four or five, six years before they had reached uh, breeding maturity. Denver Zoo tried for two years to breed these toads. In 2018, curator of ectotherms, Tom Lieber, and tropical discovery specialist, Derek Kossaboon, asked our reproductive specialist, Dr. Annika Moresco, if she could step in. And I contacted some other zoos to try to get a good protocol that we could use that had been successful previously. A protocol is like a recipe. So basically I needed to get from Detroit Zoo which hormones to use, how much, how often, that kind of stuff so that we could replicate that exactly in our toads and have it be successful. Before we could use the hormones, the toads needed to hibernate at a cozy 35 degrees from October to April. It's more about uh, adjusting their internal clock. So we'll stimulate them to reproduce when they come out of hibernation. Dr. Moresco gave the injections over the course of a week in April of this year after the toads came out of hibernation. And Derek was shocked when he came into work a few days after the last injection. Oh, it was very exciting. Um, I went to do my morning checks and saw between 12 to 1500 eggs and a pair of toads in Amplexus. So we had a, a good idea that they would be fertile. So I immediately called Tom and Annika, uh, Dr. Moresco with the good news. We were very surprised because what we were expecting was to have to go through a few trial and error years, you know, inject them, have them lay eggs that may not be viable. Excitement was high. But there is a lot of work to be done to get as many eggs possible to the toad stage. And it took everyone on our tropical discovery team to make it happen. It wasn't just Derek and Annika and I, it was our whole team that was helping out with this. Um, whether or not they were down there taking care of toads, they were probably covering on another side of the other side of the zoo because it was taking so much time. More than 600 eggs made it to the toadlet stage. And before long, it was time to hit the road and get these toads to Utah. That was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, to be able to release toads that we reproduced at the Denver Zoo and put them back in the wild is basically, I felt like the biggest part of my job. And now we're getting ready to do it all over again. The toads just went into hibernation, into a refrigerator set at 35 degrees. It may seem low tech, but all these toads need is a cold, quiet place to sleep until the spring. And this time, we're hoping for even more toads to release. You know, I'd like to see us, you know, sending out um, thousands and thousands of tadpoles and putting them in the water. Make sure to follow Denver Zoo on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for updates about our Boreal Toad program. And for more stories like this, make sure to subscribe to Denver Zoo on YouTube. Okay, well, thank you guys um, for bearing with me on that. Um, I just want to take a moment to point out a couple things and then I'm going to turn it over to Kaylee, who I think she was a cameo in that video of the releasing of the toadlets because <laughs> she was actually there. Um, but I just feel it's important to point out that, you know, the careful selection of the locations for releasing these captive uh, bred toadlets into Utah um, was based on multiple years of data like you guys are helping gather um, along with Utah Division of Wildlife Resources and their biologist expertise. Um, so to better understand how habitat suitability changes over time and where reintroductions are likely to be the most successful and where we should be prioritizing any restoration of habitat along with that, um, with those reintroductions to make sure, um, you know, that the species along with other species uh, in conservation need remain in Utah in perpetuity. So that's the link for you guys. You are gathering that have those habitat data and um, survey information for boreal toad presence and uh, populations that really help inform those conservation planning decisions. And with that, um, I want to 
Um, Earlier this oh, year. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't want to start the video again, but I don't want to forget to acknowledge all the partners, um, Division of Wildlife Resources, G Utah Ge Geologic Survey, Forest Service, of course, Hokel Zoo, um, and Wild Utah Project is so happy to partner with all of you. Um, and then we also receive funding from the Endangered Species Mitigation Fund, which allows us to continue this long-term project. But most importantly, we have to thank our community scientists. And just a little story behind this photo, this one's near and dear to my heart. You can see Kaylee in the middle there and some of the zoo interns. Um, and then some of the community scientists who stuck around toward, till the end of the day. But this was such a happy day that we shared um, because as I said, after decades of not having a, a detection of boreal toads at Silver Lake up Big Cottonwood Canyon, we did see, I can't remember now if it was four or five, but toadlets, you know, the size of a fingernail in this huge wet meadow, we were able to find them. And if it was just Kaylee and I out there, we probably wouldn't have found them. So it really helps to have have those field trips where you can you can get out. So again, this wouldn't be possible without all the partners and the community support. And with that, I'm going to give the mic over to Kaylee, um, who's been monitoring questions and also probably has uh, some personal um, um, notes about these conservation outcomes. Yeah. Um... I am also very fond of that day and it was fun because we had explained if they're finding very, very small amphibians, it's probably going to be a chorus frog. And so it was this gentleman in the red t-shirt here who found the first toadlet and it's gloves on and he caught it and he's like, oh, I found a chorus frog, it's very small. And me and Mary go over and we were just like, that's actually a toadlet. And we were just squealing and hugging and so excited and he was like, okay because <laughs> it was his first survey so he must have just thought it was very easy to find toadlets but little did he know it had been years and years and I know Mary's been going to Silver Lake for many years to see them there so six years uh, so that was an exciting day and then we touched on some of those partners that are in the reading program and all of those toads are from the Ponscombe Plateau, where Kevin Wheeler has been just dedicating time to monitoring that population. And we have done some habitat restoration down there, including BDAs, which are beaver dam analogs. And these are human made beaver dams. And we do what we can being humans. And we have finished some BDAs down there. And we're very proud of them. And then, Kevin, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, five beaver were actually reintroduced into that same area. And we were like, oh, how exciting. They're gonna kind of take over those beaver dam analogs that we built. And they, these beavers looked at them probably for a minute and they swam right downstream. And they decided to take over some natural beaver dams that were long dilapidated. They just weren't interested in our like, very hard work that we had done. But that same year, toad eggs were found right behind that beaver dam. That is how quickly those different reintroduction and restoration methods work. The beavers came, they built back up this very old ancient beaver dam that wetland was created. And that same year, toads spread back in that area. So it's really cool to see different methods work, especially so, so quickly. Uh... I forget what the next slide is, Mary, if there's more to go into. This might be the end of the presentation. Maybe we'll open it back up to questions. It is. Here's our contact information. Oh, <laughs> I hope you are speed readers. <laughs> We can we can share our contact information um, right here in the chat box. And I believe me and Mary have all of your email addresses. We'll be sending out a wrap up email of this presentation. It will have a link to the recording. And we will also share links to 
the community science page and the sign up sheets. And on that community science page, you'll find different PDFs. And I think we're going to create another one that will kind of help with that larval identification as well. They have the data sheet up there. So it will just be this uh, master email of everything that you'll need. We have had some questions. Um, I've been answering them typing. And if you click the Q&A box and you click to answer it, you can filter through some of these questions that have been answered and you might find the question that you had has been answered. Um, so some open questions right now. I know with mammals, they need to keep detailed breeding records so they don't interbreed, but do they need to be as cautious with genetics with amphibians? Uh, that is a really, really great question. Uh, within, oh, sorry, it disappeared. Our contact information is back there. Uh, here we go. So um, a lot of AZA zoos that are in North America, they have what are called species survival programs. And there are around 200 accredited zoos in the USA, and they work all together as one in these breeding programs. And they do keep um, what is essentially a stud book. And it keeps track of relatedness and genetics of amphibians, mammals, birds, that they are breeding in captivity. So it is important to keep track of those genetics. On top of that, there are some studies right now going into if the genetics of certain species of amphibians is helping them be more resistant to chytrid. So there is a lot of research going into genetics of amphibians right now. That's a really good question. Um, oh, are you going to go over the capturing and handling of the toads? So when you're out with Mary and I, we will be catching the toads, we'll be gloved, and we take the weights of the toads and the measurements of the toads. When you're conducting independent surveys, I think we are suggesting not actually handling the toads without one of the biologists of our organizations present or the DWR. Um, Mary, can you chime in on that? Yeah, and that's why um, we keep reiterating, you know, you can do these surveys and complete the habitat assessment and take photos of amphibians you see without any kit at all. Um, and the only thing we'll be missing is um, pH temperature and connectivity. And especially if you're going at, um, to some of these places we've been to before, you know, we don't, we don't need to worry about that so much. And then if you found a new site, we'll, we'll get that, we'll get back out there with a water quality meter. But yeah, if you're out by yourself and you see a toad, and you could just take a photo and um, you don't need to handle them, that would be, that would probably be best. Um, again, if you have your gloves and the, you can do a chytrid swab, that would be great, but we're not asking to do any more handling than that. The weighing and the measuring happens with um, the zoo and DWR if you're on a group field trip. And then some other questions that came through. I put a link in the, the chat box that will take you to a website where you can actually type in the coordinates from the independent sign up page and then it will show on a map where that site is just so you can visualize where you would be going. Um, Uh, this training recording will be posted on the project site, so you can come back to it. And this was in regards to the larval identification, and I think we will create some printouts with some more details on how to identify those different tadpoles when you're out in the field. Yep, and then we just had questions about different locations. So feel free to look through these questions and if you're interested in seeing some of these questions and answers. And again, um, if you know of a wetland site that you think is suitable habitat and it's not listed on the sign-up sheet anywhere, 
please pick up a toad bucket and, and go and take some of those measurements because we can't be sure that we know all the places that toads are. So just because we haven't seen any there, it doesn't mean they're not there. On the flip side of that, zero is still a great data point to have. Uh, is there an we have one question about age limit. Is there an mm -hmm. age limit on the project? I remember seeing something about 18 years old. I'm 16 and really want to help. Chase, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, mostly, I on the camping trips, it is 18 and older. So you do have to be 18 years old or older to come on the camping trips with me. The independent surveys, I believe, are open for families. And then I haven't released the day surveys the zoo will be doing yet. But on the day surveys, I am happy to take out people ages probably 15, 16 and over. Um, so let's keep in contact and we should definitely go out together because it's awesome. Uh, so that is the end of the presentation, but we are happy to stick around for any questions. You can feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the webinar chat. And we'll be here. So there was a, there's a question about signing waivers, and I believe the link to the waiver is in the chat. Um, but we will also probably do a follow-up with that linked in an email just to make sure people sign the waiver before they go out on their um on their uh, on the field trips but we've got some time before that yes oh thank you thank you for coming everyone it was really yeah. nice to turn out yeah it's good to see everybody if, if yeah, any. it does feel like that. I'm seeing some familiar names and I don't know if it's just the quarantine season, but I'm like, oh, it's so nice to virtually see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there's any agency folks still on, um, we can figure out a way to share your audio if you wanted to share anything. We are um, so lucky. We've said this a couple times, but the Forest Service and Division of Wildlife and Utah Geologic Survey um, you know, they're the habitat and wildlife managers faced with these decisions and tasked with uh, trying to get all this information across the state. And, um, you know, they're just, they've been great to coordinate with and um, really are true partners in this effort. Somebody did ask if you can see chytrid visually on amphibians. Um, I mentioned that if the disease is very regressed, you can start seeing kind of a, a red coloration on the underside and the hind limbs of amphibians. Um, but I think the majority of the time that isn't the case. And I said that I would link photos, but I can't paste photos on here. Um, but if you search, online, maybe type um, hatred on frogs. So you might see some of that, that red coloration. That's, that's a very far progressed case. Um, I think it's best to treat every site like it is chytrid positive, And then you just kind of get in that habitat of keeping, um, keeping up with your disinfection of your boots and tools every time you leave and in between sites. So if you imagine every site is positive, you'll kind of get into that good habit. Okay, so it is 8 p.m. Do oh, anyone have anything else that they'd like to share before we finish up? I think just that if, if anybody needs clarification on signing up for sites or how to get to your site or anything else, questions on the protocol, you know how to get in touch with us. Um, we'll also be sending a follow-up email about waivers and a reminder on signing up for the two different ways to participate, the group trips and the independent trips. So you'll be hearing more from us at least one more time following up 
on the training. Yeah, yeah thank you all so much for coming. It was great. Yeah, have a wonderful night. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.